Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here um, this afternoon. Um, my name is Başak Çalı uh, from the Department of Political Science. Uh, I'm very happy to be giving the lunch hour lecture today, uh, which marks the Human Rights Day. Uh, the Human Rights Day is not today. It's the 10th of December. Uh, and in 1948, uh, the 10th of December was the day when the United Nations General Assembly voted for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And that's uh, since then on, uh, in the past uh, 62 years, a lot of developments took place in the field of uh, international protection of human rights. Um, a lot of United Nations institutions uh, were set up, uh, and also um, a number of regional human rights organizations in Africa, in Americas, and in Europe. Uh, and today, I'm going to talk about um, one of these organizations, uh, the European Court of Human Rights. Um, I'd like to tell you first my first encounter uh, with the European Court of Human Rights. I think I was, well, I was in high school. I think I was 14 or 15, um, and I was reading um, newspapers. Uh, this is back in Turkey. So I was close to doing my A-levels, as that will be in the UK at the time. And I was hearing a lot of talk about the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, you know, usually the talk was so and so complained about the state to the European Court of Human Rights. And then this will follow with a gesture, something like And um, if you are familiar with that part of the world, uh, that gesture is usually a very negative connotation. It's not a good thing to complain to the European Court of Human Rights. It's, it's a rather a bad thing and a, quite a disappointment. Uh, you know, why will they complain about the state to the European Court of Human Rights? So that was my first encounter. So, um, you know, as a teenager, um, I thought, that must be a bad place because, you know, people who complain to the European Court of Human Rights is doing a bad thing. So I got very curious about this, uh, and when I went to university uh, and uh, continued studying human rights, I changed my mind. I thought it was a good thing to go to the European Court of Human Rights and not a bad thing. Uh, when I first came to the UK, uh, I realized the British citizens were also going to the European Court of Human Rights very frequently. Um, but um, I didn't encounter that sort of negative connotation of no, 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 no uh, from you know, most of the general public, except maybe a few newspapers in the UK uh, will still portray the court in this way, that you know, it's a bad place to go and it, it's where the bad people go, the, uh, you know, the terrorist suspects and the asylum seekers and the like. But what is really interesting is that this court is really the part of um, social and political life not only in Turkey or in the United Kingdom, but in 47 different countries uh, in the, in the pan-European uh, region. Um, so it's, it is, the court has been around for about 50 years now, and um, everybody knows about it, and there are a lot of people, well, over um, you know, 800 million people, actually, in total, who consider going to the European Court of Human Rights, if they have to. So, when I was a teenager, I was fascinated with the court, and now I'm an academic and I study human rights uh, <laughs> practices, and I'm still fascinated with it. Uh, so this was the beginning of uh, this research project. Um, the way that I framed my research question uh, was really motivated by this very simple fascination. How did this court survive? What made it persist for 50 years uh, given that it's actually a court that delivers very unpopular judgments, uh, it really makes governments very unhappy, it annoys a lot of people uh, in 47 different countries, and it lives on, it survives. So the question was a very simple question, how does it survive? You know, how did it actually um, survive for this long, and is it going to survive even another 50 years? So this was the question. What I would like to do in this lecture is to do three things. Um, the first is uh, to give you some very basic facts about the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, the second is to tell you uh, about the research design of you know, how one answers that question, how did the court survive? Um, and then I will walk you through uh, some of the preliminary findings of the research, and I hope that we will have some time uh, for questions um, after the presentation. <clears throat> 
So we are talking about 50 years uh, of adjudication uh, in Europe uh, when we talk about the European Court of Human Rights. And um, here are some facts. Um, the European Court of Human Rights covers 47 countries. So it is not uh, you know, uh, the Western Europe, but it is the Europe that starts from Iceland and ends in Siberia, uh, you know, because Russia is also a member of this court. Uh, the number of potential applicants is over 800 million people that could actually go to the European Court of Human Rights. And um, currently, uh, my um, colleagues at the court tell me that there are probably over 150,000 applications pending before this court. So this is also a court that really faces a huge <coughs> crisis because it's overloaded. Uh, it has 47 judges. Uh, each country has one judge. Uh, it meets uh, permanently, it's a permanent court, and there are a lot of cases. Uh, so these 800 million people are definitely, uh, you know, quite a few chunk of them are going to uh, this court. Uh, one final, um, a small detail maybe, this is not the EU court. Um, sometimes even the BBC says that, it's the EU court. Uh, the European Union uh, is a smaller uh, organization. It has 27 member states, and as you know, it's more of a, a unity of a common market and labor. Um, whereas the European Court of Human Rights um, comes from the organization called the Council of Europe, uh, which was also established after the Second World War, but it is not an economic union, but what is usually called uh, is a union of values. So the court, the European Court of Human Rights, is not the EU court, and the decisions do not come from the European Union, but rather from this pan-European uh, body. Uh, and it's always helpful to distinguish between those two. The EU has its own court, which is called um, the European Court of Justice. <coughs> so the designing of the project, this is a, a three-year project uh, funded by the uh, Economic Social uh, Research Council in the United Kingdom. Um, and as I said, the project started with this very initial um, curiosity about how is it possible uh, for this court to survive? And as you see, I had some skeptical views about the survival um, because I thought, well, very unpopular judgments. It doesn't make most people very happy uh, a lot of the times governments have to reverse uh, legislation. A lot of the times uh, domestic judges have to change their minds about how they decide on a rights issue. Um, and um, it could also be quite unpopular amongst the citizenry. You know, they may not like that um, a, a terrorist suspect's uh, right to fair trial is reminded uh, to them by an outside court because it's not very popular to talk about um, you know, those kinds of applicants, um, asylum seekers, um, uh, you know, rights of criminals and so on. Uh, so my initial uh, curiosity was that this is an interesting and unusual thing, uh, rather than a normal thing, that this court has survived for so long. So the way I decided to ask the question uh, was to turn the question around a little bit, because it's very difficult to find out why did the court survive. Um, so I said, what is the way to understand this? What, what other ways of understanding would be possible? So I turned the question a little bit around and I said, who makes it survive? Uh, so whose decisions really count for this court to survive? And why do they support this institution? What are the reasons for supporting the European Court of Human Rights? So I turned to four groups um, that I thought were the pillars, uh, the key decision makers for the survival of this court. Uh, I thought, you know, politicians, clearly, uh, they, if they, you don't have support from the politicians, you will um, uh, be in trouble. Uh, domestic judges, uh, if they don't take seriously the, the judgments of this court, then there will be serious weaknesses. Well, you have to have lawyers to bring cases before the Strasbourg court, so um, that will be a good candidate. And I thought maybe diplomats who negotiate uh, the future of these international organizations uh, and the government representatives, uh, those would also be important uh, to understand how the, this court survives and um, it's been around for about 50 years. So then the rest of the stories that we set on the road uh, to do interviews um, with these key decision makers or, or these elites that were actually quite relevant, I thought, in understanding the court. Um, so we've conducted over 150 interviews so far. 
um, with ministers, with um, senior judges, uh, with politicians um, uh, of opposition parties as well as government parties um, and lawyers, litigating lawyers in Strasbourg. And the interviews are still counting. So there will be more interviews, I think, uh, towards the end of this year with, with these decision makers. In one of the other presentations I did uh, elsewhere, um, someone asked why not to um, use some other uh, way of uh, understanding the persistence of the court? Why don't you look at whether the judgments of this court um, are respected, for example? Why to talk to people? Why not find uh, some other indicator of measuring uh, the judgments? My initial, uh, and still uh, the idea that I had was that, well, first we have to have some idea about what we can measure. And here I'm really interested in the support and the reasons for support for this institution. Um, and so talking to people about why they give reasons, what kind of reasons they give, will be the first phase of a project. And if you have a better idea about reasons for support, and then you know, one can then look at the degree of support. Uh, so whether the support is more in one place uh, than the other. So this is really the first stage uh, of a more of an exploratory study rather than a, a study that assumes uh, that we know uh, things about the support uh, for this court. So some findings from this research, and I, they are preliminary in the sense that the coding of the data is an ongoing process. Um, I will be able to give you uh, less preliminary findings when the project completes uh, this May and there will be a report, uh, a final report on this project. Um, and I will say even those will be tentative because uh, with qualitative, you do need time um, for um, uh, the coding to really settle in uh, and make sense theoretically uh, because there are millions of voices uh, that you, you're dealing with and you're trying to make sense of these voices. And uh, 150 is uh, quite a large number of interviews uh, for this type of study. Um, the first good news is, is the first preliminary finding that I had is that I found that um, a lot of people that I interviewed very much support the European Court of Human Rights, even those that I was hoping they, you know, I was thinking they will not support, for example, politicians. I thought politicians will be more skeptical, perhaps, than um, lawyers and judges. Uh, but this wasn't the case. There's mostly support uh, from all types of groups. Uh, towards the European Court of Human Rights. But again, there were a lot of criticisms of the court as well. Uh, and the criticisms were, were about the judgments. Uh, you know, there are some bad judgments or um, you know, not very clear reasoning about what happened in that case or another case. Uh, or you know, a lot of worrying about, uh, well, you know, why, why does this court, um, you know, operate in the way that it does and so on. But what I found was that even the people who criticized the court did not take it uh, to, a, to a point where they will withdraw support from the court. So the criticism was almost, most criticism, what I would call is friendly criticism, rather than criticism that was really um, you know, aimed at bringing down this court, you know, let's get rid of this court uh, once and for all. So those were two different dynamics. Uh, so when I say support, I have to qualify it. That's, you know, it's support with a, a very fair amount of criticism towards the court as well. Now, in terms of support, uh, before going back uh, forward, I found that there were two different pathways of support in the interviews. Uh, the, the way that uh, politicians, judges and lawyers and diplomats supported the court came in two different ways. One is what I call domestic value, that they were looking in terms of what kind of benefits the court provided um, to um, the, the domestic political and legal life in a country. Uh, and the other pathway is the international value, what kind of value they, think, they thought the court had beyond and above the domestic uh, legal system or the domestic politics. Um, the domestic value story came in four different uh, reasons why the uh, interviewers thought there was some value in terms of the domestic uh, importance of the court. Um, one is um, that it did improve domestic debates, uh, be it in the parliament or in the public or in the media about uh, what human rights were and you know, the, the kinds of discussions one could have about human rights. 
And, um, and, and the interview said, we find this very valuable because there is a court that has decided on, for example, quite a lot of torture cases. Uh, so, you know, if you're not familiar with what discussions may come up under torture, one could go and read up on, on a lot of torture cases from the European Court of Human Rights and say, well, it will give us ideas when we discuss amongst each other about torture. So the, it really brings down the quality to have a court that specialized on human rights issues because not all courts are, are like that in, in, the, in the domestic context. Um, so this was the first. The, the second uh, pathway uh, in terms of domestic value was that it increased awareness about human rights and uh, most people thought this was a good thing that uh, you know, somebody can say, well, you know, if I lose in my country, I will go to the European Court of Human Rights and I will try my chances one more time. That it actually brought in some sort of awareness about rights and people were aware that they had rights and if they disagreed with the parliament, that they had you know, one more place to go to make a claim uh, beyond and above their own state. And this was valued, that the citizenry actually would support the court and that's a good thing. The third pathway, which I think is an important one, was that this court is a good thing. It's almost like an insurance policy. So when things go wrong in our own country for one reason or another, if the standards drop or derail, so if there is uh, you know, a rise in, for example, uh, far-right uh, governments or, or some sort of a recurrence of authoritarian regimes, this court is there to remind everybody that there are standards that they have to live up to, even if the political environment in that country uh, becomes less human rights friendly. So this is the notion that it acts as an external corrective and it's good to have it there. Uh, and one of the interviewers put it and said, I really think we don't need it. Um, you know, we are a very good human rights respecting country, but it's good to have it just in case, uh, you know, to have an outside system. Uh, and the third uh, one that, uh, as you see, I, I heard from most from judges and politicians is that they said, well, it's good to have the Strasbourg Court because, you know, if there's a very unpopular uh, judgment, we don't want to give it because it's just too much burden, you know, we are very worried about the reactions. You know, it's good to say, well, sorry, it's the Strasbourg Court who, who gave the judgment, so, you know, blame it on the Strasbourg. And they said this really takes the pressure off. So if you want to um, have, have a decision on uh, prisoners and prisoners' rights, for example, this was a recent case in the UK, United Kingdom, maybe it is good to have the final verdict coming from outside of the state for political and for legal reasons, because most judges and politicians do face pressure uh, when they are, you know, uh, within, within a single domestic system. So they said, you know, it takes pressure off from us and it's a good thing to have this kind of a pathway. In terms of international value, I identified three pathways. And the first one and the second one, I, or the third one uh, of these pathways, I kind of you know, was guessing that this may come up, but the second one is for me the, a very interesting one. I'm, I'm still trying to understand what it means. So the first is everyone said, well, it's good to have common values uh, in the pan-European space. Uh, you know, it's not just values for us uh, in the United Kingdom, but values for everyone. Uh, and one of uh, my interviews put it in a very sort of even pragmatic way, said, well, when I'm traveling, you know, I'd like to know that the definition of torture doesn't change from, say, from the United Kingdom to Ukraine. It's a good thing, he said, that I know that it's defined in the same way so that, you know, there's some sort of a, a security for me, that there are some common values. Of course, this is a strategic argument, but some said also that, you know, it's good to have uh, common values on these issues, that you don't have human rights interpreted in very different ways in, in all of these different countries. Um, and the third one is that everyone said, well, this is good to have a court, because when you have an international court, it generally um, uh, increases respect for rule of law and, and respect for international law uh, generally. Um, so, you know, people were supporting it because they thought it had a socializing effect on uh, domestic politicians in Europe. That they had to think that there is some sort of an international law and order, that they can't just decide on things uh, based on domestic considerations only. The second one, um, which I said I, I can't find an exact title for it yet, uh, but I heard it so many times that it, it has become a very important finding of the research, is that everybody said, everybody is in. And when everybody is in, 
This means that nobody can bring the standards down. Uh, you know, their, their argument is something like, you know, the playing down the leveling field doesn't really take place in, in human rights when you have an outside court where everyone participates. Um, so if, for example, the United Kingdom uh, would like to criticize Turkey, um, then United Kingdom says, well, I'm in, you're in, I can criticize you because you can also criticize me, and we are all facing judgments from this external body. Uh, and when I comply, I would expect you to comply because you know, this, is, this, is how, uh, this is how it works. One of the interviews actually said, this is like a house of cards. Uh, and her worry was that if one state or a number of states wanted to be out, um, say in the, in the coming 10 years, that it could, it could be quite risky for this court because then everybody would start maybe leaving the institution. Uh, but she was saying that the fascinating thing is everybody stays in and it gives a reason for everyone to continue to be in the system. Uh, and as I said, uh, this is an interesting logic. It's a, it's a very strategic way of thinking about the court, uh, but uh, it definitely was a reason that everybody um, uh, suggested that was important. As I said, there are reasons, and some very strong reasons, uh, for the court to exist, but of course um, there are skeptics of the court as well. And these were the three uh, categories uh, that came up quite frequently in the interviews. Um, one was that this court um, delivers judgments that um, are not very acceptable um, when it damages our national uh, or domestic pride. Um, the argument here is that if you have um, a system where you really trust your own system, and if you really trust your own institutions, um, and then they say, well, and an outside court comes and tells you what to do. Uh, a lot of people were saying this, we are not very comfortable uh, with this dynamic because we have our human rights protections in, in our country that have been going on for a very, very long time. And an outside court not knowing our own history interfering uh, with that system uh, is really harming the integrity of what we have built over the years. Uh, as you see, the, the domestic pride argument was really coming from countries that were very proud of their own uh, rights traditions. Um, so this was one very complicated argument, but it was there. The other one was about national ideology that I highlighted. And this usually came from um, politicians who subscribed to a very particular uh, view of uh, you know, how things should be run in a specific country. And they were saying that, well, we have a way of um, living in our own country, and the European Court of Human Rights cannot just come and tell us how, uh, you know, how, how we live or how we should, uh, how we should conduct our affairs. Um, one of the recent examples of this was a, a very disputed case uh, called the Crucifix case. Um, that is a case against Italy. Uh, and it involves whether having a cross in, in, in the classrooms, uh, in, in schools in Italy or not. And here the, the discussion was, well, we should really have uh, to make this decision ourselves rather than uh, an outside court to tell us about you know, certain values that we may have, political values, cultural val values, or religious values, that these are for domestic um, context to decide. There was also criticism about um, bad judgments um, because the court has delivered over 10,000 judgments uh, in the past 50 years, and not all of them are very good. And this will be the case with any court. Uh, not every single court is able to give very good judgments. So one line of criticism was uh, about bad judgments. And the other one was a doubt about whether all of these judges who sit in Strasbourg were competent enough to, um, to adjudicate on these very complicated matters. So that, a discussion, uh, again, about um, uh, composition of the court. <coughs> How could we make sense of, uh, of these reasons and the, and the counter-criticisms? Um, what I found in, in the overall coding of the whole, um, whole interviews was that Despite criticisms, and some of them very heavy criticisms, the interviewers never withdrew their support from the idea of the court, 
that there should be a court um, at uh, the pan-European level to decide on some of these cases. And this is, an, this is an interesting argument because you can say, well, if they thought the court was doing a very, very bad job, uh, you know, one could say, well, you know, I think we should, we should get rid of the court uh, and we should maybe think about a new institution. This wasn't uh, the case in, in most of these findings. So I started thinking why this may be the case. Um, and going back to the interviews and, and looking at them one more time, um, what um, I, I started finding was that the two types of values, the domestic value and the international value, um, worked almost um, in a way that would create some sort of a net effect of support rather than uh, working in competition with each other. So what does this mean? So even though um, some uh, interviewees were unhappy with the judgments of the courts in relation to their own countries, they still felt that they had to support the court because of its international value that it wasn't worth to um, completely bring down the system uh, because of um, the international value that the system had. And it also worked vice versa. Some thought that it had no international value or very limited international value, but identified a very strong domestic value in the system and decided, sort of on a balance of reasons, decided to stay in the system rather than uh, you know, come out of the system or, or to, to uh, to have uh, um, to protest the existence of this institution altogether. Um, but there's a lot of criticism, but as I said, I think I would phrase this criticism as friendly criticism rather than criticism to bring down the institution. So the findings are quite, um, from my interpretation, uh, they're quite optimistic. Um, one other dynamic that I found in, in the reasons was that when the politicians um, didn't uh, like the court uh, because it didn't match with their preferences, it seemed that judges, domestic judges, will end up supporting it. When the domestic judges failed in um, their uh, support, it looked like there were lawyers and applicants uh, who would bring those cases to Strasbourg and, and get a judgment. And it almost there was a circular sort of withdrawing of support and then gaining support for the European Court of Human Rights. Um, so when there was a judgment, then the judgment will mobilize political support um, and then there will be some uh, legislative change uh, following that. So even though one part of the population withdrew their support or criticized the court heavily, there was somebody else to balance uh, the, the, you know, the, sort of the lack of support from one side or the other. So there's a sort of a spiral um, in terms of you know, who, get, who gives support and then who uh, withdraws support from this institution. Um, I am quite optimistic, uh, but um, one final, I guess, finding that uh, I think is, is interesting um, is the, um, in some, well, quite a few of the interviews, uh, the interviews were not always optimistic. One uh, discussion that they had was the rise of uh, far-right uh, political parties in Europe. Uh, very recently, for example, in the Netherlands, there are discussions about whether uh, the Netherlands needs the European Court of Human Rights. And also in the United Kingdom, there were discussions about whether the United Kingdom uh, needs the European Court of Human Rights. So here the question is whether there will be enough political support from this whole pan-European region to change uh, this very long-standing, this 50 years of practice uh, and, and decide not to have such an institution in the European space. Um, I think um, you will have to have a lot of far-right parties all coming into power pretty much at the same time uh, for this dynamic to take place. And um, again, I think uh, I'm on the optimistic side, but we can have uh, some discussions uh, on this if you um, are interested in. So let me conclude to say that um, Happy Human Rights Day, which is the 10th of December, and um, uh, some of you may uh, use your rights to uh, peaceful assembly and protest uh, maybe during this week which is protected by Article 11 of the European Convention of Human Rights. But if you have some free time, you can uh, mark this uh, by reading a human rights judgment this week and uh, see how uh, the court reasons on these issues. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Berzak. So we do have some time for some questions.
Uh, I open it to the floor now. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Robert Hazel, a colleague of Bashex in the School of Public Policy. Thank you for a really excellent lecture. Can you tell us which were the five countries uh, that you selected for your interviews and what the criteria were for selecting those five? And if the five included some long-standing members of the Council of Europe and some of the newer uh, member states, can you tell us whether you found any differences in the attitudes expressed in the interviews between, as it were, the older members and the newer members? Thank you. Um, shall I repeat the question? Um, so Professor Hazel was asking about oh, in which countries I carried out the field work and whether uh, there were differences in terms of attitudes um, you know, when you had interviews from one country to the other. Um, the, the sample of countries included, or there are five of them uh, that the interviews took place, are United Kingdom, uh, Ireland, uh, Germany, uh, Bulgaria, and Turkey. Uh, but all the diplomats' uh, interviews um, were covered uh, quite a few of the other, almost half of the Council of Europe member states, so there's a variation there. Um, the way the, 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 this case, um, the, the five countries were selected out of 47, um, is, a, is a mixture of considerations. Um, one was about um, the number of judgments, the number of very controversial judgments um, that uh, were delivered against these countries. So I wanted to have a variation in terms of uh, countries that were not challenged very much by the court because they had very little case law and countries that uh, faced a lot of litigation. Uh, so Ireland and uh, Germany are on the least number of litigation side the uh, United Kingdom is in the middle, and uh, Turkey and Bulgaria are on the other end, where they face um, lots of litigation on very controversial, um, controversial issues. And I wanted to have a mix of old member states, uh, founding member states, and a newer uh, member states. So there's a variation there, uh, and also a variation in um, judicial uh, structures, and also in, in terms of political system and political regime variation there as well. Um, in terms of attitudes, um, that's a research paper, the, the differences between um, the attitudes in these different places. Um, some arguments um, saturate in different places. So one, I think, significant finding uh, was um, this finding that I highlighted about domestic pride in, in, the, in the rights protections in, in that particular system. Uh, when you have a country where there are old, long-standing uh, human rights um, protections, or if, if it's viewed that way, if it's the perception. So um, in the United Kingdom, in Ireland and in Germany, uh, this was a very you know, clear um, point, that everybody was very proud of what they had already, and also so, thought that the European Court of Human Rights was not always getting it right, that you know, they didn't know better uh, in, in most of these contexts. Um, but in terms of how they dealt uh, with uh, the question of national pride, even those three countries differed. Um, so uh, Germany and United Kingdom, um, mostly I found that they were more willing to um, uh, engage uh, with the court and its judgments, whereas in Ireland they were less so. So the variation uh, took place you know, on, on different issues. There were groups of countries that differed, but also uh, still very micro-level variations as well, amongst politicians and judges, even in the same country. Question in the back. Just hold it like um, this is probably going to sound very naive, but um, if um, the European Court comes to a judgment, does that really have the power to overturn a judgment that was made in, in the, the country where the court case was originally heard? Or is it just a sort of opinion that they're offering? Um, so the question is about whether the European Court of Human Rights has any enforcement uh, authority um, and what is the status of its decisions are. It doesn't have that power, no. It, it cannot overturn uh, judgments uh, of, a, of a domestic court. Uh, but it, what it does is it finds a violation uh, of the European Convention on Human Rights, and it asks the state to remedy that violation. 
so it goes back to the state authorities. Uh, well, depending on the case, it either goes back to the politicians to legislate or to judges to take into account uh, or to the Ministry of uh, Justice to pay some compensation uh, based on that um, violation. So the court cannot do this. It has no enforcement authority whatsoever. Uh, so this has to be done by the states themselves, so the, by the state authorities. Um, sorry, the, you spoke about the four groups of people who you interviewed, which um, you could kind of characterise as a sort of governing elite, if you like, so you're kind of looking at governing elite attitudes to the European court. And you started talking about you know, growing up in Turkey with the media attitudes. I wondered if you thought of looking at media and sort of public opinion attitudes to the court and if, if, you know, why you decided against looking at those as well. Um, so the question is about whether uh, looking at public attitudes or, or attitudes in media will uh, help. I think um, if you ask the question in a different way, uh, I mean, if you broaden the perception analysis, uh, media is definitely part, part of the story. Um, the way that I identify effects of media is through how elites um, viewed the media, whether it mattered to them. Uh, you know, when they had views about the court, so, you know, when I asked them questions about what do you think about, um, uh, you know, criticisms of the court, uh, you know, for example, in your own um, country, whether they use those as reasons to say, well, you know, if, if there's a lot of um, negative media, then, you know, my views will change and so on. Uh, but the study as such uh, focused on elites uh, because I thought that they really... Um, are the key decision makers. Uh, the way that I set it up was that they enable this court to survive because they, they take the decisions either by bringing cases or by following the judgments or by complying with the judgments. They are the ones uh, you know, who actually have the institution to survive. Um, maybe one thing I didn't mention is that it's not just this institution survives, but it's also relevant. Uh, so that makes it interesting in that uh, quite a few of the judgments are followed and complied with in relation to the previous question as well. So, you know, decision makers in, in these 47 countries implement, um, you know, quite a few of the decisions. So that's why I wanted to focus on the um, domestic decision makers. A question from Lady in Green. We still have a question. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the lecture. I would like to ask about the consistency. Um, as far as I know, uh, the court is not bound by its own decisions. So whether this uh, characteristic uh, was researched by you, and what is the opinion of judges, um, whether the, if the court is not bound by its own decision, um, and it can, um, han it can have different decisions? Um, this did come up in the interviews with judges, um, and quite a few of the domestic judges were concerned about that, um, as why they would or would not support um, the court. But usually the, um, their analysis focused on a case-by-case -case level, uh, so the judges were very happy about um, some jurisprudence in certain areas and not very happy about the others. Um, so they saw this as an advantage, as well as a disadvantage of, of the court, uh, that it was not bound by precedent. Call it a day at that. Um, so thank you very much for the questions, and thank you particularly for Bashak for a very interesting talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.